It's May 15, 1800, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. If you had narrowly dodged a mystery shooter's bullet mere hours before, you probably wouldn't be in the mood to go to the theatre that evening. But George III was made of sterner stuff today in history in 1800 when he shrugged off a possible assassination attempt in Hyde Park and turned up at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane to take his mind off the day's events by enjoying London's hottest comedy. And then a gun went off. (laughs) Yeah, Michael Kelly, the musical director of the theatre, recorded the events as they went down. He wrote, When the arrival of the king was announced, the band, as usual, played God Save the King. I was standing at the stage door opposite the royal box to see his majesty. The moment he entered the box, a man in the pit next to the orchestra on the right hand stood up on the bench and discharged a pistol at our august monarch as he came to the front of the box. Never shall I forget his majesty's coolness. The whole audience was in uproar. The king, on hearing the report of the pistol, retired a pace or two, stopped, and stood firmly for an instant. Then he came forward to the very front of the box, put his opera glass to his eye, and looked around the house without the smallest appearance of alarm or discomposure. (laughs) So he just really recorded that the king was cool as a cucumber on this day. Well, second time in a day, like Rebecca said, that he's been shot at. I suppose so. It's an old hat now. <laughs> I mean, we'll get to who the man was that stood up and shot him in a moment. But let's just firstly explain why anyone might have wanted to kill George III. Look, if if you're an American listening to this in particular, he does feature quite uh, repeatedly in the Declaration of Independence, which is essentially a large document um, continuously slagging him off. <laughs> so your perspective on George III is going to be basically the one from Hamilton, right? I know that. Um, but for Brits at the time, if you weren't Irish, He was a pretty popular king, actually. He'd come to the throne young at 22, so he was kind of cool. He was known as Farmer George because he took an interest in agriculture and wrote about um, farming techniques. He was pretty hands-on and financially prudent as well. So it's just important to lay all that out, I think, because I I think you look at the era, you know, 1800, and you think, oh, is this a sort of Marie Antoinette-type situation where the people out to get him because he was squandering the royal monies? No. Not in his case. He did do a lot of repressing of Catholics, so there were people who disliked him. But actually, most of the British people were fans of the king and were distressed to see someone try and shoot at him. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that George may have been a little cool in the firing line was that this was not the first attempt on his life. Uh, In 1786, a mentally ill woman called Margaret Nicholson attempted to stab him. Four years later, another mentally ill assailant called John Frith lobbed a stone at the royal coach as he was on his way to the state opening of Parliament. And the attempt that had supposedly happened earlier on this day may or may not have actually been an assassination attempt. So it happened at this point with 40 years into what would eventually be a 60 year reign. And George was at Hyde Park to review the troops of the Grenadier Guards. And as they fired off a volley of supposed blanks, a Navy office clerk called Ongley, who was 23 feet away from the king, sank to the ground. A bullet had passed through his thigh an inch away from hitting the femoral artery, which would have been obviously fatal. The wound was dressed on the scene, luckily by a military surgeon. The shot, it turned out, was a musket ball and had to have come from one of the soldiers. But an inspection of their cartridge boxes revealed no live ammunition. So it wasn't clear well, it if would, it was would, an wouldn't accident. wouldn't it? I mean, the Navy's hardly going to say, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Your Majesty. <laughs> <laughs> you made a mistake there. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing. It's like they weren't able to find any other live ammunition. So if someone had accidentally mixed up live rounds with blanks and you would have found more live rounds, it's interesting that it was just that one bullet. Anyway, it wasn't clear if it was an accident, but it was widely feared to have been deliberate, partly because of previous assassination attempts. But George himself believed that it was an accident and he actually stayed for the rest of the review. He was like, fire off some more rounds. I'm sure it won't happen again. And he did the exact same thing later that day by continuing to stay and watch the performance rather than just going home, which you'd think is what your average monarch might do. But, you know, in the chaos and confusion, the orchestra seized the perpetrator, who was an ex-soldier named James Hadfield, who was also later judged insane. It seems like that is a common theme that runs through this whole business with uh, would-be assassins of King George III. Uh, And they dragged him into the music room under the stage, where he was examined by the Duke of York, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, who was the theatre's manager, and Sir William Addington, who was a Bow Street magistrate. That's Sheridan as in Sheridan the playwright, who we've done an episode about before, right? Like, most famous playwright of the era. This is like Andrew Lloyd Webber attending to King Charles after he's been shot. (laughs) It's true. 
And meanwhile, upstairs, the audience is demanding that Hadfield should be brought onto the stage. But basically, Kelly, the musical director I mentioned earlier, succeeded in calming down the audience with the assurance that he was safe in custody. And basically, if they brought him upstairs, he might have the chance to escape, uh, let alone, I guess, (laughs) be ripped limb from limb by a baying crowd. (laughs) And when the shots were being fired, the Lord Chamberlain, who was with George in the box, tactfully suggested that the king retire from the firing line, to which he supposedly replied, you discompose me as well as yourself. I shall not stir a step. Meanwhile, Queen Charlotte and the couple's daughters were still coming up the stairs when the shot was fired. But Richard Sheridan, quick thinking, assured her that the noise must be a banger thrown by mischievous boys. (laughs) Not run, your majesty, get the heck out of here. (laughs) (laughs) But by this point, against all the odds, you know, the whole royal family were in the box. The audience had been calmed and the show was able to go on. Although, as Kelly notes, never was a piece so hurried over. Over, for the performers were all in the greatest agitation and confusion. Yes, I can imagine. Well, when Hadfield was being detained, he'd stated, quote, it is not over yet. There is a great deal more and worse to be done. So this sort of the show must go on attitude of loveys is really hard won on this evening. You know, they're thinking he's been shot at twice today. Is he going to be shot at again if we carry on? And the play that they were putting on, by the way, was a revival. You know, George III could have gone home and read it if he was really worried about what happens (laughs) next. Um, So there must have been a feeling like, is this wise? Um, If you're wondering why Hadfield's gun didn't hit George, I mean, yes, we've said that he was uh, declared insane. He'd been discharged from the army for lunacy, but he was in the army, a decorated soldier, fought in Flanders in the 15th Light Dragoons Regiment. How did he miss his target? Uh, According to the commercial and agricultural magazine who reported on this, (laughs) I suppose, whoever happened to be sitting in the theatre or Drury Lane that night got the scoop. Um, Mr. Holroyd of Scotland Yard had the good fortune to raise the arm of the assassin so as to direct the contents of the pistol towards the roof of the box. So again, it's actually sort of luck that there was a police officer right by Hadfield as he took his gun out who predicted what was about to happen. And it must have been hugely unsettling you know, that this was just a lucky escape and that the assassin has warned us there's more to come. Well, it might also have been the fact that James Hadfield wasn't at the height of his powers at this stage. He'd actually sustained uh, severe injuries in the Battle of Turking in 1794. Uh, but before his capture by the French, he, he was uh, struck with eight sabre blows to the head, leaving lasting scars, both physical and psychological. He then came back to England and became associated with a millennialist movement believing that his own death at the hands of the British government would hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in collaboration with Bannister Trulock, who was a shoemaker and religious fanatic uh, who prophesied the second coming of Jesus, uh, which he thought, by the way, would happen right out of his own mouth, Hadfield conspired to assassinate the king and then bring about his own judicial execution. And he thought this would be the thing that triggered uh, the second coming. The other legacy that we have from this day in history is a thing nobody wanted, another verse to the national anthem. Um, (laughs) Because in tribute to the king's resilience, on the night, Sheridan wrote an extra verse, which he then came out and sang. (laughs) Sing it, sing it, do it, man. (laughs) I can give you the words. It's pretty good, but I mean, you know, written by Sheridan. From every latent foe, from the assassin's blow, God saves the king. O'er him thine arm extend, for Britain's sake defend, our father, prince and friend. God save the king. (laughs) Nothing rhymes with Hadfield, that's the problem. (laughs) (laughs) Tomorrow. His grandfather, who was the king, obviously, considered him to be both ungainly and (laughs) dim-witted. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.